everyone, and welcome to another episode of Eurohoop Pod, the official podcast of Eurohoops. I'm Adonis Strogilakis. As usually, I'm joined by my great colleague, Cesare Milanti. And tonight, we have a really, a really great, special, unique kind of a guest that you can see in front of you. This guy is one of the most successful American players who ever competed in EuroLeague. Three-time EuroLeague champion with Panathinaikos. Dozens and uh, numerous domestic league uh, titles and individual distinctions. One of the OGs, maybe the OG, when it comes to the whole <laughs> undersized sender thing that became popular in EuroLeague from the mid-zeros and uh, onward. A, a legend of EuroLeague basketball by now, Mike <laughs> Batiste. Mike, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I am the OG to the small ball. Trust me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. you Every, know? Everybody, everybody now who's playing a small ball all say, Mike, we, we got it from you. We saw you. So it's it's a big honor to, to have that. We're going to talk about uh, this thing. You know, it's funny. Uh, before we begin to the normal floor of conversation, some also mentioned Daryl Middleton from Panath- Panathinaikos being. Well, he... He was my Jedi master. Uh, Daryl was my Jedi master. I was his Padawan. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, you were the Darth Vader, and he was the Obi-Wan. Yeah. <laughs> but remember, re- remember, you know, the teacher, you know, saying eventually passed the master. So, you know, Daryl was a big help for me uh, because, our, as you guys know the story, I didn't come to Pantanaikos to play uh, the center position of five spot. Yeah, you were a three. So, I... I Right. And, uh, you know, when the transition was being made for me to slide down to the power forward, to slide down to the center, the first person I got with was Daryl Middleton, because at that time he was an undersized center. Right. Um, he knew every tricks of the trade. He knew how to use his body. He knew how to seal bigger guys in the paint and open up angles for him to score, open up an angle for a guard to drive the ball to the rim. So there was a lot of nuances that Daryl taught me. And then with my talent, my IQ, my athleticism, I just enhanced everything that he taught me. So, you know, big props to Daryl Middleton. I, I really wouldn't be the player uh, um, that people know about if it wasn't for Daryl Middleton. Yeah, Daryl Middleton, for those who don't know, another uh, great of Panathinaikos, won the EuroLeague with uh, the Greece in 2002 in Bologna. Mm-hmm. So... Let's mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about uh, your current so your current job basically. Uh, so everyone knows you are an assistant coach at the Toronto Raptors. You guys mm-hmm. just beat the Charlotte Hornets, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, now, we just won the other day. Yeah, and you are eleven fifteen. Can you give us a small assessment of the team's uh, run uh, so far? How pleased or maybe not pleased you are with it? What do you think? No, we're we're very pleased with what we have. Of course, you know there's times where. Other teams have more than us. They probably have more shooting. They probably have more talent. But at the end of the day, you can't be afraid of what you don't have. You know, you you come in here, you prepare with the game plan. You walk the guys through. You make them confident on what's going to happen tonight. And then we'll play as hard as we can for 48 minutes. Uh, tonight, we got a very, very tough matchup because we have, you know, the NBA champions uh, coming here, Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, uh very tough uh, night for us tonight but we're going to give it our best we're going to you know throw different defenders at Jokic we're going to mix up different coverages on him and hopefully that'll keep us uh you know uh tight into the game to where you know the last five six minutes of the game um uh anything can go so you know it's going to be tough but we're at home we have our crowd behind us and we should play well today because a lot of guys do play well at home than they do on the road so do you do you like set a ceiling for for the team this season? The goal of uh, of Toronto for this season? Uh, we really haven't set a ceiling. I, and and honestly, when you get on a team, you never want to really set a certain ceiling because a lot of things can happen before that ceiling, right? Injuries uh, and other things may happen. So we try to make uh, small goals. Right. We try to get guys to shoot the ball better. We try to get guys to operate out of the system better where they're going to catch the ball, whether that's in a corner of the three point line, the wing of the three point line. If they're catching the ball at the elbow, certain uh, scoring areas, we try to give them every option as possible. So when they catch the ball, they're not holding it. You know, everybody talk about this point five offense moving the ball, which is which is the king here all over the, uh, the world of basketball because you never want to have a stagnant offense that only helps the defense when you're just in a stationary position. 
So we're trying to really preach a lot of ball movement, a lot of body movement cutting because, uh, you know, there are some things that we don't have that a lot of other teams have. So sharing the ball and moving body parts has uh, been a really big staple for us. And if you look at the stats, we're top five in assists. Uh, so we're, we're moving the ball very well. The thing is we got to make shots when we, you know, uh, get those wide open threes or wide open jump shots. Yeah, and the NBA remains a shooter's league, <laughs> of course. It's always will. <laughs> so you joined uh, the Raptors with uh, Darko Rajakovic, uh, the second uh, the second coach who European born head coach in the NBA. Mm -hmm. after Igor uh, Kokoskov, uh, you yourself, of course, had this kind of rich and very successful experience playing in Europe. Uh, so I can't help but task. Uh, he asked you to join the team. Was one of the reasons your European experience uh, that special, unique element that you might bring on board because of that? Of course, uh, I've, you know I've I've been well. This would be my tenth year. I've been with seven different teams, right? And seven different teams is like what I brought to the table, right? It's been my background, my European career. Um, you know how I teach bigs, you know, to screen, roll, to defend. And 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 in general, just how you know pick and roll offense should be operated with the spacing, with the cutting, with the certain ball handler, with the certain screen and roller, the lob threat. So, all my ideals that I ever had when I was a player are being brought to fruition here with the Toronto Raptors, but also the other teams that I work with as as well. And uh, I've been very very happy with you know my progress, um, where I'm going, and it's only going to get better uh, from here. I was reading that uh, part of your job was focus on the big men. And uh, one of the mm -hmm. big men of the team is uh, your all-star, Pascal Siakam. Mm -hmm. uh, what, mm -hmm. uh, what things, what uh, parts from your career, what experience from your career, what lessons that you got from your playing career do you teach Pascal Siakam and those guys? Well, it all depends. You know, you after a game, you always sit back and watch video so you can make the right corrections because sometimes things that you see in a game are totally different than what you see on, on video. So from my experience, it could be for him passing the ball. He could have two in the ball. It could be a simple pass. He could be wide open and he will hesitate on a jump shot. He won't shoot it. So there's certain little nuances that you're trying to give these guys. They already have it already, right? Especially Pascal Siakam, who, who's a you know, two-time All-Star. He has a really good skill set offensively, defensively. So You're just trying to give him little tricks of the trade that he already knows. And then when he sees that from the video uh, platform, he's one one of the few guys that can see what on video and then go right on the court and do what he just saw on, on a video. So uh, Pascal, again, he's a highly skilled player. He's uh, one guy that we rely on for his, uh, his leadership. He is an NBA world champion, and he's doing the, the best that he can right now. And we have no complaints with Pascal. He's been professional. Uh, throughout the whole ordeal, you know, saying the new coaching change, new staff, uh, new offense, new defensive philosophy and principles. Uh, he's he's been pretty good with that, and we appreciate that a lot. And Mike, regardless of the the focuses of your of your jobs as a as assistant coach, as you reminded mm -hmm. us, you've been with several NBA teams for the past few years. So, what things mm -hmm. have you have you learned from each assistant coaching tenure, if you can name us? Um, uh, let's see. Well, you know, my, most of my time was done with, uh, Steve Clifford, uh, who's a very detailed kind of coach. I'm serious. Like he goes through every pin down, every post up, how to, you know, navigate screens, um, how to guard the ball handler, how to guard the screener. He had every detail for, for every situation. So I really, really learned a lot from, uh, Steve Clifford. And I still do learn a lot from Steve Clifford, you know, through text messages, you know, I talk with him. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I can, I mean, he's busy as well. Uh, we just played him a couple of days ago. So it was good to sit down and, and pick his brain on a couple of things because he's so defensive minded. Like you can, you know, throw out any scenario out there to cliff and we can sit there and brainstorm and come up with a, with a game. My, my first initial stop, which was Brooklyn after I got out the G league, you know, with Kenny Atkinson, uh, you know, Kenny had a player development background turned into head coach and just like his involvement, his communication with the players, even sometimes jumping in drills, you know what I mean? Just to interact with them a certain way. Uh, you know, I learned a lot from Kenny, uh, learned a lot from Steve Clifford, you know, my time with, uh, with Washington and West Unseld also learned a lot of patience as well. 
and also what it's like to to be a first time head coach into a rebuild, right? So this is this is my well, let me see. Darko is my this would be my third time joining basically uh, a, a a new situation. So I've been here before. Uh, my experience on those new situation always uh, are helpful, and uh, you know everything that I learned from every head coach I work for has all been beneficial to the point that I am here right now. So of course you always take certain things from coaches. Of course you have your, your own philosophy. Uh, you know, hopefully in time when I'm blessed to be a head coach, I have a vision of how my team should look offensively. I have a vision of how my team should look defensively. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, that amount to, to, to some good wins and victories, but who knows what the future holds, but when that happened, you know, I'll, I'll be ready. And we, we talked about Pascal before, what he provides to the team, the, the talent mm -hmm. he has. But there's another interesting figure in, in Toronto uh, mm -hmm. since, since this summer, which is Danny Schroeder, uh, who signed with, uh, with the Raptors in July. And two months later, he became a world champion with, with Germany and the MVP of the tournament as like the leader of uh, Gordon, mm -hmm. Gordon Albert team. So uh, we saw the, the amount of confidence he had all throughout that tournament. How has mm -hmm. that helped me going into the season with the uh, with the team in Toronto? I mean, having Dennis here has been helpful. I mean, you know, winning a a World Cup title that is, I mean, that's amazing. That's big, and he brings that wealth of experience to our team because we we do have a somewhat of an international based team, right? Yeah. So uh, those experience the whole team, like his teammates, the coaching staff, watching what he went through this summer. We're only trying to catapult off that momentum that he that he brought from Germany. Now, again, in this NBA, winning is hard in this league, man. It's very, very hard. Uh, and over my course of my career, I've seen guys play some unbelievable games, right? But we still lost. So this 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 uh this association, uh, it's like I said, it's very hard to win. And even when you play at your best, you can still uh get beaten. That's one of the most difficult, you know, things in this league. But Uh, Dennis has been just like Pascal. He's brought the leadership. He has really taken a couple guys under his wing, like Malachi Flynn, really starting to help his development now because I don't think he had somebody to really put their arm around uh, his shoulder to tell him what to look at in high pick and roll, what to look at in side pick and roll, how to attack and transition, even though Malachi knows. But just to get an added resource behind him, like, like a Dennis Shooter, who's not also a World Cup champion, but has also played for a lot of uh, other teams in this league. He's uh, been with OKC with Chris Paul. So I'm pretty sure he's learned a lot of things from Chris Paul. Yeah. He's also trying to, you know, rub that off onto a Malachi Flynn and also to a Scotty Barnes as well, to all the guys who handles the ball and who's our playmaker, who's our decision makers. He's been really good at that department and trying to help guys see what he sees on the floor. So when they're in those positions, they know how to attack to score or they know how to attack when they draw two on the ball to, to find an open man. Yeah. And from, uh, from Dennis Schroeder, European guy, let's move slowly to your own European journey. And uh, <laughs> of course, we'll have to begin with uh, Panathinaikos. And I'd like to start with, uh, I don't know if you, if you saw it, did you see what your former teammate, uh, Dimitris Papanikolaou wrote on your birthday in his LinkedIn, he wrote it in Greek. Did you see it? For no, I didn't. Oh. No, I didn't. Well, he says, uh, once upon a time in Greece, an athlete came named Mike Batiste. He was below average in his uh, first season. Uh, he didn't play a lot for a foreign guy. Uh, it was difficult for him to adjust. And everyone on the, and the team was looking for a replacement. And then Mike makes his self-criticism. He sends a message to the coaching staff. And he says that, uh, give me another chance, and I, I, I accept a pay decrease. So mm -hmm. he stayed on the team. He became a, a player who made millions and won things, one of the best in his position in Europe. Sometimes to move forward, you have to go backward. And he ends mm -hmm. his message as, happy birthday, Mike Batiste. So that's yeah. the, the, the happy birthday message in a way for you and also a message for uh, for other players, for other aspiring. Players. Yeah, no, no doubt. That, that's that's a great message. Sometimes you got to take 10 steps back to move two steps forward. Um, you know, that that time of my career, well, I wouldn't say it was difficult, but after, you know, my first year, you know, it was a lot of ups and downs. I battled some injuries. 
Um, I struggled with 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 the rules, the spacing, uh, the discipline of Obradovich because there was a way that he coached you to perfection. There's a lot of things I had to get used to being out of the country, family not there. Uh, and I was very young and immature on handling those situations. So, you know, after that first season in Pantanaikos, I, you know, go back home in the summer. I have some NBA offers, but they're really not as up to par of my standards of what I really wanted, right? So I waited, waited all summer. Uh, the three teams I was talking to, Atlanta, New Orleans, Orlando, uh, we just did come with an agreement. And so, like you, like the story said, I called the team back. Um, I said, listen, if you guys would like to have me, I would like to come back. But they was like, there's only one thing, you know, you're going to have to take a pay decrease and this is what it is. And I accepted that my agent, you know, Ty Ely thought I was crazy, but I said, listen, man, I know the system. I know the coach. I know what I'm about to get into. So from that standpoint, I have an, an advantage. So the moment I landed in Athens, I took advantage of every situation that I had. I came in the best shape of my life. My body was healthy. I healed up from the ankle injuries, the hamstring injuries that I had the first year. And I studied uh, a lot more. I mean, you know, growing up as a little kid, everything is on the forefront with the NBA. You know, I grew up in L.A. watching the Lakers. I watched tons of, you know, NBA games when I was young. But I had to transform from watching NBA games to watching more European games to know uh, player strength, their weaknesses, their tendencies, and what they like to do. You know, if they're grabbing on their shorts mentally, that tells me that they're tired. If they're breathing hard, you know what I mean? They're tired. There's certain little nuances that I started taking to give me an advantage on the court to also give my teammates an advantage on the court. So the way that I studied and the way that Orbanovich and Tudis helped all of us study and become a professional in that aspect of the game only enhance my my skill set, my fundamentals, and my my IQ. Considering that uh, it wasn't easy for you during the first season, and you acknowledge that uh, you know Obradovich as a coach, if you are a rookie playing for him, a new guy playing for him, not necessarily young, new to his mm-hmm. style of coaching and to his systems and to his discipline, you know some players may say, no, this is not for me, I'm out. Some mm-hmm. players may say that. Some players <laughs> will will recognize, will see some things. On Obradovich and see that okay, this guy can make him can make me better, can maybe become great. Mm-hmm. And many players yeah. have become great with Obradovich. How easy or difficult was it for you to make that decision, that call during that summer? Oh, it, it was difficult. You know, I've had you know my run-ins with Obradovich. I've been under his intense pressure uh, to to push me through the door, to push me to be better. Uh, again, that was. Also a maturity situation for me as well, because even my first year, when he would say certain things to 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 provocate me to push better, I would not receive the message very well, you know, because in the NBA, you know, you have a lot of freedom here and you're spoiled here. And a lot of coaches really don't get on you during the game, right? They wait for it at halftime or maybe the next day, you know, you'll call a certain player in the office, you'll sit down, and watch video with him as an individual. But this is the first time I've ever been kind of, you know, called out in front of the team uh, for certain situations. And my first year, I didn't like it. But the second year, I took it as a challenge, you know. And everything that Obadovich and Tudis put me up against, whether it was difficult or not, I took the challenge and I tried to run with, run with it, whether I succeeded or failed. I succeeded more times than I failed, but <laughs> he challenged he challenged me uh in every situation. And once I, again, once I was able to, uh, to the best of our ability and we answer every test that he put out in front of us. And I think that's the reason why we was, you know, so successful. When, uh, in the rare occasions that Zelko Bradovic was a free agent during some summers, especially before he joined the uh, Partizan, mm-hmm. there was, uh, there was this question uh why is he not in the nba why is he not coaching in the nba uh, you know uh, zeliko bradovic has has told some part of this uh, this is his side on why he, he hasn't coached in the nba for example he said that uh, they tell me to go through an interview and i say to them i give interview to journalists not teams for example, <laughs> of the story 
But uh, do you think that Zeliko Bradovic, consider his, considering his character also, you know, the way he likes his discipline, the way he speaks to players sometimes in timeouts, I'm not saying that necessarily mm-hmm. he would act like that way in the NBA, but do you think that he could have become a head coach in the NBA? No doubt. Listen, Obradovich is a freaking genius, man. And for 30 teams to not consider him to be a heckle for a team, I don't know, you know, what that situation is. But Sorry I will tell you this. Maybe, maybe, maybe the right question is not if he would become, maybe if you if he would succeed as a head coach in the NBA. No doubt he will. Yeah. He, listen, he's the guru of pick and roll. There are things that I see a lot of NBA teams are doing now, even some plays that we run with Toronto right now. And we oh. was doing that back in 2006, 2007, 2008. So to see Orbanovich's blueprint on the pick and roll game, which right every, the basket, where basketball has gone, he's the catalyst of that. And for any team to not consider him to not coach, that's crazy in itself. But I would say this, for a team to, to hire Orbanovich, right, uh, you're going to have to draft or you're going to have to sign, trade for strong character, mentally tough players because you can't give Obradovich or arm him with the certain tools of mentally weak players. Those players are not for him. You got to have strong basketball character, strong team character. You have to be mentally tough. He's going to challenge you mentally. He's not going to challenge you physically. He knows your heart, your drive, your discipline, your determination. He knows your skill set. But the game is so mental, right? You have to focus on so many different things, Uh, the pace and speed of the game, the way guys cut, the way guys screens, the way guys come off of pick and roll to shoot, to drive. He's the master in all that, right? And again, for any NBA team that hires him, you better make sure you have 15 to 17 tough, strong-minded kind of players that will handle that situation. And moving on to to the present of Panathinaikos, they they're trying to 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 make like new beginnings to have uh, new beginnings to return to glory days eventually, and they went big everywhere, big signing, big budget, mm-hmm. big head coach. Considering the fact that he won back to back Euro titles with uh, with FS, now they had mm-hmm. a lot of they have had a lot of uh, quite some ups and downs. What do you think of the team now? They're following them. What do you think of? Of Pana, yeah. The, hey, listen, they're they're doing great considering what happened, you know, in years past or three, four years. They're fine, right? Uh, what they're seven and seven, I think. Seven and uh, seven uh, tonight they face Monaco. Yeah, so they may be so eight seven, seven, seven up when we publish this podcast. But but regardless of what the result is, eight and seven, seven and eight. They wasn't at this position a couple of years ago, so they are fine, right? The Euro League is, I'm pretty sure, just like the NBA. Very hard to win games now, right? Everybody plays everybody. There's no more group play, pool play. You can't hide from certain teams no more. You have to go through the gauntlet. And what they're doing now, like I said, is good. They got the head coach, right? Ottoman, back-to-back champion. There's a start there. Then with all the big signing with Le, Le Sword and uh, Hernan Gomez, uh, the list goes on and on. They are right where they're supposed to be. Uh, I believe they're going to be in a playoffs or play in, however, however that happens. And I really believe we're going to see Pat Tanayko's fighting for uh, a Final Four spot this year. So I'm hoping that they make the playoffs so I can have a little vacation. So I can come over to Athens. I can see everybody, my brothers and, and people that I, I admire and love and respect a lot. And I can also, you know, catch a couple basketball games. So. I'm definitely keeping my fingers crossed that, you know, they continue to make uh, the right strides, uh, which they are. And hopefully, uh, you know, when the season's over with, they are slotted in one of those spots to where they're, again, they're fighting for uh, a Final Four uh, position. You you mentioned the sort uh, among the, the players who, who are shining with Pana and he's being huge for them. Considering the fact that he he put himself on top of the fives in the in the Euroleague with Jeliko Bradovic. What do you think about mm-hmm. his progression so far in the, in the competition? It's, it's been nothing but remarkable. Like you said, we saw the transition for him and Partizan uh, under Bradovic. He's taken those lessons, uh, you know, to Panathinaikos, and he's playing very, very well. I mean, the few times that I've saw Panathinaikos uh, play, he's been, he's been outstanding. 
Uh, I've been, you know, kind of checking on stats and other little things when I can't catch games. To me, he's been one of the, you know, the best centers uh, in, in the competition. So for that to, you know, transition to happen under Abadovich and to bring that to Panathinaikos under Ottoman, it's a, it's a beautiful picture that we're seeing right now. And I hope that it continues to trend in the right direction because he's one of the main focal points, one of the big signings. Uh, and the people, even the coaching staff, the fans of Panthinaikos are expecting a lot for him. And I think right now he's he's doing a good job at it. For sure. Mike, uh, you won, as everyone knows, won the EuroLeague with Pana 2007, 2009, 2011, year by year. Uh, now, each of those teams had a couple of differences, different key players that were on one team and weren't on the other team. Ziskauska, Saras, Panulis, Pekovic. You were one of those people who, were, who was present on all those teams. Which one, mm -hmm. which of those editions of Panathinaikos was your favorite? Which one of my editions? Uh, when we signed Peko. Of, of when this, we signed... No, 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 but yeah, tell me which one of those editions was your favorite. But uh, my question was also, which one of these editions of Panathinaikos, the 2007 team, the 2009 or 2011 team, was your favorite? 2009. Uh, okay. And... I know a lot of people say, oh, that's the best team. And I, I think it is too. But 2009 was, I mean, it was an unbelievable year for us. Of course, like you said, the roster that we had with Yeskavisha, Dimitita, Spanuli, B, Pekovic, Fultzi, Sataris. I mean, you look on paper and you're like, yeah, they're they're winning the championship, Super everything. Good. But but we didn't start that way. Uh, and actually, I wouldn't actually say we started bad, but we didn't start with the level of expectation that everybody – thought that we was going to do right because in 2007 I remember we ran off like 14 15 games in a row and everybody's like oh shoot like this is a well-oiled machine we should see this team uh in the final four when 2009 started everybody had those same expectations but we didn't start well I remember losing a Greek home game to Marusi I remember that very next week we lose a game to Panalingos we was in a very very difficult spot to so where either we're going to go south and keep losing games or we're going to go north and keep winning games. And from that little debate or whatever we had in the locker room, I would say it was a very, very heated discussion because we lost to a team that we wasn't supposed to lose to. And in the month of February, where the top 16 are the most difficult games and you also have your cup game, we was mentally in a very bad spot. And I think from that locker room altercation you know everybody just you know took we had a day off we took a day off we came back to ne the next day with a different kind of focus right and a different type of uh, mentality and we attacked every single practice as if it was a, a a game and from those practices it carried over to the game and it carried over to another game and i think that year uh the month of february we won every single game except the game in Seth where we lose at, at the buzzer to, to Olympiaco. So we saw the actual turning point after that loss to Panalingos, winning 11 out of 12 games in the month of February only gave us the momentum to, to carry forward. So the 2009 team was a very, very, very special team. You know, Drew Nicholas was on that team. He's a really good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine. We talk almost daily, uh, you know, his uh, job with the Denver Nuggets, you know, he's been doing a really good job in the front office over there. Uh, Stratos Paperlu was on that team. Uh, we we had, a, a, again, a really good roster. And for any situation, you want to pay fast, you want to play so small, big. I felt we had the, the, the roster to to match up with anybody uh, in Europe. You talked about the locker room altercation that happened mm -hmm. when exactly during that season? <laughs> it was a it was it was we lost the Greek League game to Panelinos. Panelinos, uh, yeah. And I remember, you know, Bradovic, he was not talking about the game. I'll tell you that. He was talking about some more personal stuff. And then after Bradovic finished talking, guess who comes in? The Nasi comes in. So that's a little bit, yeah. Cause you know the Typhoon Thanasis, for those who don't know his nickname, the Typhoon. Right. Yeah, he's a yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he comes through the door, and yeah, you might think he's, you know, this small, but when he walks through the door, he's this big, and he's going after every single player 
telling him what they should do, what blah, blah, blah. And these are the consequences. So, you know, again, like I said, we all took in as much information, uh, you know, as we did. I took in all the information that was directed towards me. I'm pretty sure every player took the information that was directed towards them. We've had the day off. We came back the next day. We had a total a different uh, focus on practice. Like the very first warm up, we was going at 100% because we knew we had to get to it. We knew the pressure that was among us. We knew how everybody was looking at this team to, to win. And with those type of pressure, we just attacked it with every single practice and it carried over to the game. So, Thanasis Yanakopoulos' visit at the locker room was a kind of a game changer for you that season. Oh, yeah. That's what you're telling me. And you give me also the pass to ask you this question. Thanasis Yanakopoulos and uh, Pavlos Yanakopoulos, the late Pavlos and Thanasis Yanakopoulos, legends of the club, legends of European uh, basketball when it comes to executives. Actually, mm -hmm. the presidents of Panathinaikos, the, fam the family essentially made Panathinaikos the dynasty that they became with the six EuroLeague titles apart from so many domestic trophies. These two people were mm -hmm. very close to the team because also they were huge and passionate fans to the team. It wasn't just two people who were you know, putting money on the team. They had mm -hmm. genuine passion for the team. What's your fondest memory of the Yanakopoulos brothers? I just think their, their undying support was the most thing that I remember. You know, you also have to remember we didn't win a yearly title every single year. Uh, we had disappointments. We had certain adversities. Uh, you know, me personally, like you said, like after my first year, I think I'm not going to be here. And then, you know, the year in 2007, I remember telling myself personally, if we don't win a yearly championship, I probably won't be here next year. So, There's a lot of different things that as a player you thought about, but I think uh, the, the the common support that we got for both of them, even though the nasty was a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more pushy, probably getting your face a little bit more, their undying support was was a big help for, for all of us. Uh, their undying support for me personally was big because from America, I have my family here, don't have the big support system in terms of mother, brother, sister, and certain things that I can say to them because they know who I am. I didn't have that, right? So to have the certain support of Pavlos to come in and ask about my family, how's my mother's doing, how my brother's doing, right? That was big for me, right? Because the at times you think that, right, and because at times you really think that nobody really cares about your life, Right. You have this contract you sign, you have this obligation to be the best you can be. But do they really care about the actual person and what goes on like personally in their life? And I had a lot of personal issues, uh, you know, with Pan uh, you know, about Avicii Tudis and the Yanakopoulos brothers. They was behind me. They put their arms around me. They they of course, they didn't like the situation, but. I was one of theirs and they did whatever they did to help me get out of that situation so I can just focus on, on basketball at all costs. So I really, 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 really uh, appreciate, uh, you know, the help from the Nassi and, and Pavlos. Um, you know, I miss them dearly. I know a lot of other people miss them dearly because, like you said, their contribution to European basketball, but also to, to Greek basketball as well is, is, is second to none. And to lose two people like that to the game of basketball, it, it's it's a blow. Um, but, you know, the game goes on. Uh, Dimitri Yanakopoulos, you know, this year has did an unbelievable job in terms of putting, getting a good coach, putting a good roster together. And hopefully that will manifest into, you know, being in the Final Four, hopefully winning um, the EuroLeague title. And this is, you mentioned also Dimitri Yanakopoulos, the son of Pablo uh, Yanakopoulos and uh, the nephew of Thanasis. And most people don't realize, especially people in the USA, that uh, when when uh, we're talking about owners, presidents of the, of the club in Europe, these are people who basically spend money in a business that is not lucrative. They mm -hmm. spend money and they don't expect money back necessarily. They, they, mm -hmm. they do, it's, not, it's not a profitable business, owning a basketball right. club in Europe. So they, mm -hmm. do it, they do everything out of their sheer love of the club. And mm -hmm. this is also the follow-up with Dimitris Yanakopoulos now. Right. I mean, they to to put so much money into a club, like you said, and not get any 
you know, money back like owners do here. That is a deep rooted love for the sport of basketball. And this is the reason why I felt like the Yana Kappa's brother was so uh, successful because of their love for the game, not expecting anything in return, only manifested into joy and happiness of winning yearly titles, Greek titles, uh, beating Olympiacos when we have those rival games. Uh, there was a lot of other things that paid him back, right? Not monetarily, but winning the yearly title, winning the holding that crown. trophy in, his, in their in their arms was right. Bad. That was that was his. I felt like that was his payback for the money that he put in. And every time you know he was, we blessed him with that. Uh, I felt that in his mind that the plan that he's putting out with all the money and not getting anything returned is the best plan for for <laughs> for him, for the club, and for the fans and everybody else. So. Uh, again, to 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 have that deep rooted love for the game of basketball and to not expect anything in return, that only speaks uh you know high volumes to the kind of owners that they were, and why we were so successful. You know, I I tell a lot of people here, uh, you know, there's a couple of teams that I worked on. I don't want to mention any names, but their leadership, they wanted leadership to start from the from the ground up, right? That's never going to happen. I'm sorry. And you're never going to have success. The leadership comes from the top and it trickles all the way down to the ground level, to the floor. So that's why I thought that we were so successful in Panathinaikos because we knew we've messed around with Obradovich, which very seldom you would never do. But you knew Thanasio Pavos would come down there and, and straighten your ass out. And that's you <laughs> didn't want to get to you didn't want to get to that level, right? Because you didn't want to get to that level. So Either you take this measure from Bradovich, you do it, or you're going to keep messing around to the point where Pavlos or, or Thanasi is going to get on you. And at that point, you don't want that. You know what I mean? So I'd rather take the message from Bradovich and move on than, you know, sitting down, taking a real stern message from, from Thanasi, right? So, again, uh, very two very special uh, human beings, uh, two special individuals. Uh, two individuals that I that, that that I admire because again I think I I got to Athens I was 24 years old I was a young man and by the time I left Athens I was a grown man so and I learned a lot of things uh, from Pavlo Santanasi I took a lot of family values from from those two and I implemented in, implemented that into my own family when I sit down you know with wife and kids and we have our dinner you know we're at the table. We're talking about, you know, school. We're talking about their respect of sport uh, and just what's going on in, in their life. Those are the things that, you know, that I took from uh, the Nasty and Paul, but also the Greek culture in general. You know, I had also friends outside of Panathinaikos and when they invite me to their house on a Sunday and all their family is there and everybody is eating at the table. Everybody is conversating about good things, bad things, or whatever it was, you know, I was like, this is something that I want to implement in, in my own family. So we can sit there and talk about everything because the way the world is now, I mean, everybody has their phone. You can dive into any kind of world that you want to now. Right. Uh, and to disconnect from that world and get back into reality is, is a really big thing for, for me and, and my family. So I try to use that every single day. Wow. That was a, such a great insight of, of, of the lessons that uh, you get. And I am impressed by what you said about the lessons that you still keep and put in other parts of your life outside of basketball. That, that's mm -hmm. really amazing for me. Well, you know, basketball and life has a lot of parallels. Yeah. You know, trust me. Uh, it teaches you how to work with different people. It teaches you how to advise or give the right advice uh, at the right time. Uh, so... Ba basketball in life has has a lot of lot of parallels and i'm still using a lot of basketball lessons in my life lessons as well i'm you know i'm 46 years old um you know i don't know everything uh but every day that i wake up i'm i'm open minded and i'm you know willing to learn looking to learn and and to get better uh every single day so coming back to, to to the present Euroleague, Mike, um, we talked a little bit about Pana before, but but mm -hmm. among like the rest of the competition, the level of the competition, we know you watch it, you follow it. What do you think of that? And 
which teams are your favorite to to extend and progress the run eventually to the final four in Berlin? Uh, I mean, well, you see Madrid is at the top. I mean, they're playing lights out. I think they only lost one game in EuroLeague. You they have Barcelona good. right. Yeah, you have Barcelona behind him in second. But, you know, one of my surprises is uh, Viritas, right? They're what, yeah. third, fourth, fourth Viritas place, is something like that. Viritas club second right now because they beat Tony nope. and Barca lost. No, there, no, there you have it. So you're seeing different teams be in that top four slot. Like last year, Monaco was that top four slot, right? Freshly new to EuroLeague, but they have the talent, the pieces to the puzzle. To uh to to play at a high, to play at a high level, um. But Virtus has has been a big surprise for me this year. Uh, of course, Partizan is is the hottest team in Europe league right now. They didn't start in very well, but they found a groove. They've been shooting the ball very well over the last five, six, seven, eight games. Uh, so they've been playing very well. And I know it's an Arbatovic team. I played on an Arbatovic, but those are one of the teams that I continue to see trending in the right direction from from where they started. And to where they're going now, you know, Abradovich is pushing those guys to the door to get into a higher uh, seating, right? To get into one of those top four spots. Uh, you know, so I think we're going to see a lot more intense games, uh, a lot more situation, nail biters, uh, teams being in third place, trying to fight to stay in third. It, you know, a lot of scenarios that keeps you on the edge of your seat. Like even last season when I used to watch games, I used to be on the edge of my seat. I'm not even on the edge of my seat when I watch NBA games, but <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat when I watch yearly games because you know the pressure, you know, like the, the atmosphere, you know what the what those players are thinking at stake to a perspective, to, to a certain perspective, right? you know all of it. So there, yeah. there is times where I am really on the edge of my seat because I can put myself in that position. Like, man, I remember playing this game in front of this crowd two minutes to go and we have to execute. I can only imagine what these players are going through deja right, vu. right now in, the, in their mind. Yeah, you know, saying you're having a deja vu moment. So again, uh, you know, I haven't caught a lot of games. Uh, like I told you before, like sometimes I might have enough time to catch a quarter Maybe sometime a, half, a first half, sometime might be a second half. Uh, but the partisan Panthinaikos game was one of the games that, that I did get a chance to watch and start to finish. And it was a you know a very, very good game, you know, for you know, Panthinaikos did play well. I know they didn't like the result that they got because they ended up losing. But partisan, you know, they they fought and will they worry to to victory because they was not playing well throughout that whole game. And even they was losing, you know, late in the game. They were, yeah, they were losing late in the fourth quarter. They found the way, you know, to 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 get back in the game. So, uh, again, every game that I've been watching, it's been it's been thrilling. And and as a basketball fan, even though I am a coach, but as a fan, this is what you want to 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 watch. You want to feel Definitely. like you're a part of the situation. And every time I watch a yearly game, I feel like I'm a part of that, you know, uh, because the intense situation, my experience of being in it, you know, keeps that intense, uh, you know, burning in, inside of me. So it's, it's always good, you know, when I can watch the early games and I've told people this many times before, you know, games come on here at one, two o'clock, you know, that's, you know, if I don't go home after shoot around, like I'm in my office right now, I just, you know, Bluetooth that thing right to the TV, sit here and watch the games. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, I try to watch as, as much games as possible because basketball is a worldwide conglomerate. Now, you can't just shut yourself off to the NBA or to just Europe. Right. Uh, when when I retired, I shut myself off of EuroLeague. I had to disconnect a little bit. And as you start seeing the rise of basketball, and how it's connected worldwide, you had to get back into it and embrace, uh, you know, your your past time. And also you have to embrace what's going on in into the presence. Like, you know, I told my brother the other day, he was like, you know, I try to stay away from, from EuroLeague as much as possible. That's a past time for me. You know, I buried that guy a long time ago because I wanted to be looked at as a, as a coach so much. But at the end of the day, you know, what I did over in Europe is so profound it's so hard to hide and and run away from you know. Why keeping that behind? I mean, these are great yeah. things. These are things that define you. These are things that define Mike Batiste. 
Yeah, no, yeah, no doubt. But you know, um, I really enjoy my time as a player. I'm, I'm not going to lie. The success and stuff that I had, don't get me wrong, it does crosses my mind. You, you know, you think about it for a short second, but I'm so locked into into the present and where I'm trying to go as a coach and how I can better myself, how I can better uh, individual player, how I can better the team. So as long as my focus stays on that, um, I again, like I said, I know I'm I'm moving in in the right direction. And talking about players, uh, back in May you visited uh, another podcast with a pretty good guest, I would say, pretty good host, I would say, which is Kai Lines. And uh, mm -hmm. and you you said, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that the top three favorite players to watch for you are Mike James in the Euroleague. Are Mike James mm -hmm. were Mike James. Lorenzo Brown and Dwayne Bacon. Do you have another mm -hmm. top three? Do you have other names in mind when it comes to that? Uh, I like watching Poirier from Madrid. Of course, uh, we have Lasora Pantanikos. Uh, I'm always watch bigs. I mean, that's the natural position that I played. I mean, the moment you you turn the TV on, it's just natural to watch who's running the floor, who's setting screen, who's rolling, whatever. Uh, but again, it's, it's been a lot of good, you know, guard play as well. I mean, Costa Lucas has really been doing a good job at Panathinaikos. Uh, of course, Mike James is always going to be at the forefront, the way he score and his skill set. So there's a lot of guys that I'm watching a little bit more instead of, you know, the three guys that I like watching um, last time, uh, you know. And I think it's going to be some more players added on that list. And, I, you know, once our season starts to calm down a little bit more here, I'll be able to watch, you know, more yearly games, more complete games, and then I can start adding some more favorite players on onto my list. But again, I watch teams, I watch players, and everything that I watch is is thrilling, and it has me, you know, on the edge of, you know, my seat. The the guys that you like watching, you root for them. You hope that when you watch the game, that they don't play a bad game because you feel like you're superstitious and you jinxed everything because you watched their game. But uh, at the end of the day, again, you hope that they're 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 playing well and you support them, you know, whether they play good or bad, because I wasn't always perfect, uh, you know, playing. I had, you know, some OK moments, I had bad moments, uh, you know, again, like we said, more times than not, I succeeded. But knowing what those guys are going through when they go 0 for 4, 0 for 5, they're not shooting well. You can really put yourself into their shoes and and help them out a lot from those situations. So. Um, rooting for those guys. I hope they stay injury free, and I hope that all the goals that they set out uh, in front of them, whether that's individual team, I hope that they're able to accomplish that. And talking a little bit about fantasy, uh, fantasy scenario in which Mike Batiste plays in today's Euroleague, where would it be, <laughs> and with who, with with who as a head coach? Me now. Yeah. yeah. Who? Uh, or, or, uh, or let's say, let's say the Mike Batista of two thousand nine or two thousand eleven. Yeah. The the peak of your career, perhaps. Like who? Like who would I want to play for right now? Exactly. I mean, shit, Which team would you pick? Team better. Uh, <laughs> of course. I mean, it's a no brainer, man. You know, I'm always choosing Bradovich. He's the top of the top. I think any team that he went to and I played under him, I think I would have some form of the same kind of success. Uh, but that also de depends on the personnel of your team and everything else because of also was on a team, uh, which you look on paper, you're like, oh my God, they're going to win a lot of games. But the connection just wasn't there. The leadership just wasn't there. And it, deter it turned into something worse than it should have been good. So I'm going to stick to what I know be since I know about this, since I know how he coaches you, how tough-minded he coaches you, I would rather go into a situation that I know about where I can have certain advantages yeah. than trying to go to another team and trying to figure things out. Then it takes you about, what, two, three, four months to figure out the philosophy, rhythm, all this stuff. I would rather go into a situation that I know about. So right from the very first day of practice, preseason game, real season games, I know what I'm doing. So it's going to have to be a Radovich or a two of these guys that, that, that I played under. These guys are still – uh, the best at their craft. I know Etudis had the, the change from Fenerbahce, but we know he's going to find a, a job soon. Uh, but those guys are still at the top of, of their profession, even now, as I've been 10 years away from the yearly game, these guys are still at the top of their profession. So those would be the guys that I would want to play for. 
And if I had to advise certain players that had a choice to choose between an Obradovich or somebody else, you go play for part of time. You don't go play for somebody else. You take advantage of, you know, the greatest coach of all time. He's going to make you a better player. He's going to make you a better person. And if you don't want to be a better version of yourself from that, then I don't know what to say. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Mike, we have just two questions for you, so don't worry. <laughs> we are we are wrapping it up uh, soon. No, don't worry. The first question I have is, uh, well, we said it, we started with this. You are considered a pioneer by players like Kyle Hines, for example. Kyle Hines has said mm-hmm. many times that uh, he was one of the, you were one of those players he was looking up to when he began his mm-hmm. career in Euroleague as the one who maybe started this revolution of undersized big men that took over Euroleague. Mm-hmm. Meet zeros and downward. How do you feel about it when your successors, in a way, talk about you with such a praise? Uh, listen, it's it's a it's a real who is not only in his own legacy of what he's done is remarkable, but he's also keeping you know my legacy alive as well. Because when I see Kyle Hines play, I see a lot of myself in him. Just because, like you said, the the undersized center. Uh, the way we defend, pick and roll, leadership and everything else. He brings all that stuff to the table. So, of course, I see a lot of myself in him as the same that he does with me. So, uh, again, like I said, that's a really big honor because Kyle had to study, you know, some parts of my game to actually know, like, what I'm about because, you know, we've only really sat down with each other maybe three, four, five times through our whole lifetime. So for him to become one with me or understand me, he had to watch film on me. And uh, that is a a big respect uh, in itself as well. Uh, And for somebody to dissect, you know, everything that I did, you can really tell where his IQ is because he really broke down certain details of my game, the way I ran the floor, the way I screened, the way I communicated coverages to, to the guards so they, you know, wouldn't get hit on a screen. Uh, you know, uh, that's a, that's big, big time respect. And and again, you see other guys like a Brian Dunstan and Alex Ty, certain little small ball five guys, uh, Dante Hall down there in Monaco. You see a lot of undersized guys that have similarities just like you. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, I'm, I'm the originator, <laughs> the OG <laughs> in it. So. I'm always choose myself over over anybody. That's just what it is. I'm pretty sure those guys that choose themselves over anybody, how it should be. That's you know respect to that. But at the end of the day, to see where uh, the undersized big started, and now to see where it's going. Right, it is still going now uh, in Europe. Uh, you know, every you know it, it puts a big smile on my face. But at, at the end of the day, I'm very thrilled and happy for the guys who are playing in it now. Uh, enhancing the small ball undersized center, but also developing other things in their game. So when their time is done, they're talking about what he did for the game. Never talk about, oh, you know, he took this from Mike Batiste. No, this is this is his legacy. When he walks out the door, this is what you're going to remember and this is what you're going to talk about. So Mike, to go full circle now to make the connection, Europe and the NBA, Please tell us which players from the Euroleague or maybe European basketball in general right now you could drop on an NBA team and they would instantly deliver. Instantly deliver? Oh, yeah. no, that's, I know, that, but... uh, that's tough. I mean, you know, a lot of, you know, you look at a lot of Euroleague rosters right now, a lot of guys have NBA experience, right? Whether they went there first, came to Europe or started in Europe, went to the NBA, and and came back. When you look at that Real Madrid team, right? When you look at Real Madrid's team, they have an NBA roster, right? Yeah. I believe that that team can can really you can plug them into this association right now, and they will give a lot of teams in the NBA everything that they got. And what I mean yeah, by you that, believe that, wow, that, that's impressive. Oh yeah, like yeah. I don't I don't think I don't really think there to be a blowout by any measure. I think teams are really going to have to dig in deep. They're going to have to execute. They're going to have to mentally get ready for a a grind out type of game and winning in the last five or six minutes. Uh, When you see 
Fernandez, Lul, Rodriguez, Poirier, Tavares, like these guys all have NBA experience. So to put them on this platform, I think that all those guys will accept that challenge and they will do their best that, that they can. I mean, of course, you know, Madrid beats, you know, Dallas in a friendly game and, and Madrid, I mean, you can't really put too much on that. But at the end of the day, I, I believe that, you know, if they was to play in the NBA, uh, I really believe that they can win some games here. And I think a lot of, you know, fans here in the NBA will really understand, uh, number one, Madrid's organization, but also European basketball. You know, it's played at such a different uh, pace. We execute, they execute differently. A lot of high IQ fundamental skill set players are uh, playing in yearly. Uh, those are the guys that I feel that you can plug into uh, an NBA system and they will provide everything that they need because, you know, guys get drafted here so young and early and their game is not fully developed, but we give them the resources uh, to develop those skills, whether they are full time on the roster with us all year or they go into the G League and they work on a craft there. So uh, it's uh, it's it's. Very, very, like, very, very small will we see uh, certain teams that can compete with NBA teams, but I know Madrid is one of them. Barcelona is probably another one, too, as well. Uh, but the guys who has the high IQ, the guys who has a high level of uh, fundamentals, and the guys who has a really good skill set are the ones that are going to survive in the NBA. And honestly, that those are going to be more European players. Their games are developed way faster than what we developed these guys over here uh in america so from from that perspective you're going to see way more uh fundamentally sound players you're going to see guys with high level skill sets and you're also going to see guys play the game from an iq standpoint that a lot of people here don't really understand the mind game of of basketball and tonight you're going to see one of the best High level <laughs> IQ in Nikola Jokic, right? Because yeah. every defense you throw at him, he has an option for it. So, you know, we really have to be really, really good. We have to be in our positions early. We cannot be late when he kicks the ball out and we have to rotate. We cannot be late. And we have to, you know, again, like I said, do different things to make him think. But when you make him think, you're also helping one of his strongest attributes. So, um, Again, we'll, we'll be careful with that. But again, those guys, the Jokic's of the world uh, with the fundamentals, the skill set, IQ, those are the guys that can come here into the NBA right away and, and play. And for me personally, those are the guys that I look for, you know what I mean, who can actually come in, plug and play, uh, will accept a role, will be a star in a role and won't give us no problems on the court, in the locker room, and it's constantly going to be about uh, winning, you know? So those are the guys that that, that I look after. Hopefully um, we can get those type of guys here on this roster. We do have some of those guys now, but the more the merrier. The more guys that you can get with a, with a high-level IQ, uh, the better your team would be, the better your roster would be. And that's the luxury that, you know, myself and my teammates had at Panathinaikos, right? Yeah, we were very good players, but I think our IQ really separated us from uh, the pack. We was able to fill the game out in the first quarter, make adjustments in that first quarter. If I was guarding somebody a certain way that we game plan, but I feel that it should be different, I would run right to Arbatovic. They say, let me guard him this way, and maybe Arbatovic should be with it. Maybe he not be with it, or maybe we might adjust to that situation at halftime. So, um a lot, a lot of, lot of good things are are coming uh, from Europe. Uh, I'm hoping more guys are coming over here into the association. Uh, we don't know. Only help. Uh, seriously, <laughs> please. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this summer we received the blow. Mitic, Vezenkov, Exum. I mean, enough. Please, NBA. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, listen. Uh, I, I, I listen. I, I don't wish that either, but it's tough. I mean, the guys yeah, understands the. You know, they understand the economics of the NBA, right? The money is sure. getting higher and higher yeah, each yeah, year. Yeah. The salary cap is getting higher each year. So I think there's a there's a level of comfort and stability when you know about the economics, how the money is going. You're getting paid all the time. There's no messing around with that. There's only one thing, and that's basketball. 
you know, and if you can get your mind wrapped around the game for six, seven, eight months, those are the guys who are going to win. Those are the guys who are going to get better. Those are the guys who are going to evolve into a special player. And hopefully they will have longevity uh, within their career. Mike Batiste, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, as dominant as he was in the player, as uh, illuminating and uh, really great, talkative in a great way and uh, teaching us things right now. Thank you so much for this conversation, Mike. This this trip down memory lane with Panathinaikos, this, uh, you know, ha having hearing you, your insight on all things basketball, it was amazing. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. You know, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Anytime you want to do it again, I'm... I'm here for you guys. So um, stay blessed. Uh, tell everybody Athens hello. But uh, <laughs> I, I hope to see you. you <laughs> tell them yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, like I said, hopefully I'll be able to tell them, you know, myself in person. Uh, I'm really hoping Panthenagos can make it to the playoffs so I can get up over there. Also plan to go to the Final Four in Germany as well. Uh, you know, I have family over in, in Germany. Uh, my father's brother, you know, Married a German woman, had family over there, so they still reside over there. So to kind of be two birds at one stone to see basketball and also see family as well is something that I'm planning. So uh, but hopefully all this all, all, all to work out you because we know what happened in 2009. So yeah, but listen, <laughs> also you know when you go to these Final Fours, you're so disciplined. You're not worried about whatever goes on, right? But then you know you talk to your mom, the family, wife, and everybody else. Oh, we're taking a bike ride around the city. Oh, and we're doing all this stuff. And <laughs> and as much as you want to be with them, you can't because you have this obligation to, you know, and this goal that you set out for yourself. So you have to sacrifice that and put that on the back burner. But now if I do get that chance to go, hopefully I can be able to do the sightseeing and all the stuff that I couldn't do as a player. It's hopefully I, I can I can do now. And just enjoy it. Exactly. You know, <laughs> as a player, you're you have all this anxiety, you know, running through your system, you're nervous and there's the butterflies in the stomach, you know, you're ready to release that. And now hopefully again, like you said, I don't have to be in those intense situations. I can just enjoy the festivities. Well, we hope uh, we will definitely enjoy the festivities at the final four <laughs> uh, this season. And we hope you, we see you there, uh, Mike. Now to our viewers and um, our listeners, you can find us always you can find this episode on YouTube, Ed, on Spotify, and other platforms, platforms from Mike Batiste, European basketball legend. Cesare Milanti, thank you again. Thank you, Antonis, and thank you, Mike. Um, thank you. Take care, everyone, and good luck, uh, Mike, with the Raptors, with the season, and see you at the Final Four. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys soon, man. It's been a pleasure to talk to you guys soon. And Merry Christmas, more importantly. We forgot, ah, the, most yeah. I can't be we forgot the most important thing. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New Year again because we will yeah. be with you next week as well. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Bye.